Good morning, everyone. Are you ready? We sure are. There's been a lot of planning that has gone into this session and the seminars and people have gone some great lengths to be here and I'm really excited, especially uh, being part of Coming Out Ministries for the last 13 years. It's been our desire to be able to reach a lot of people, whether it's in person, well, mostly in person, but even virtually. And so thank you that these are being recorded and that they can be used as a library resources in the future. Before I begin, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity, Lord, to speak out and to talk about the injustices, Lord, that are happening in our world, but also, Lord, that are happening in our church. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us a heart of tenderness and that, Lord, that with compassion we can address these issues head on as we face the future, Lord, knowing that you are coming soon. And, Lord, we want your kingdom to be full. And so we ask, Lord, that, that every word that I say and everything that I share, Lord, would be to your honor and glory and would be edifying, Lord, not only for the church, but for every individual that has come to hear. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So Coming Out Ministries, here's my clicker. All right, so Coming Out Ministries, our vision statement is to ignite an unquenchable movement, restoring all men and women back to the image of our creator, God. And you know, that's not a gay thing. It's not a straight thing. It's really about what happened in Genesis. And ever since Adam and Eve ate from that tree, God has been in the pursuit from Genesis to Revelation of restoring us back to the image of what was lost. We don't want to uh, compromise that word. We don't want to compromise that process. And, and as an end time church, we believe that it's our responsibility. We believe that it's our privilege to help people to find the truth as it is through Jesus Christ. And I think that that's going to be a very difficult thing to do in our world today when government is passing laws that are protecting issues that we are basically trying to confront and to show the compassion of Jesus to restore and to renew. I'd like to give you just a little bit of my history. Um, at four years old, my very first conscious thought was that I was a girl trapped in a boy's body. I don't know how that happened. I was just all of a sudden aware of the fact that I wasn't like the boys in the neighborhood that would call me sissy, queer, little girl. And yet I was surrounded by femininity. I had three sisters and I wanted to be like them, but I knew that I wasn't like them either. I don't know where those thoughts or those feelings came, but eventually, at the age of 13, I started to have same-sex attraction. <clears throat> and I didn't want that either. I didn't know where that happened. And it wasn't until I was in my 40s, the second time that I became an Adventist, after I left the gay culture for 20 years that I identified with, that I created this identity and I indulged in it and thought that I was born that way because that was my very first conscious thought. Now, I say that not to uh, garner your, your uh, sympathies, but basically to let you know that there are people that struggle with identity issues. There are people that struggle with different attractions that go against what the Bible says, because remember, we were all shaped in iniquity. We were all born into sin. Sin are the things that come naturally to us. And so for somebody that identifies that way, there is a reason. And so we need to have compassion. I was just in Columbia recently, and this young man pulled me aside as we were doing our presentations at the university in Unca, and he basically said, you know, the one thing that the church is missing is listening. You know, they're so quick to come up with an answer, but when do they take the time to actually sit down and ask me what I've experienced or ask me what I'm going through? And again, in my own um, experience, I had that as well. When I went to the church at 20 years old trying to you know, kind of bring these things together, bring my sexuality and my identity together. Because not only was I struggling with transgender ideation, I was also struggling with same-sex attraction. I thought I was doing the right thing. I had a girlfriend. I wanted to be a husband. I wanted to, be a wife, um, to have a wife. I wanted to have children. And so one night, I sat down with this brother that I handpicked. I, I remember for weeks just looking around the church, who am I going to trust with this secret? And finally, I picked one guy that I thought I could trust. And I sat down with him and I said, hey, can I talk to you? And he said, sure, Mike, what's up? And I said, well, it has to do with girls. And before I could say another word, he said something so derogatory about women, I knew I couldn't trust him. And I sat there and I listened to him. And I walked out of church that night and I said to God, is that the best you've got? Because if that's the best you've got, I'm done. I'm out of here. And that was when I went headlong into the gay culture and they had their arms open wide. As a matter of fact, I remember that as I went into the gay culture, 
they weren't afraid to talk about the issues that I was struggling with. They weren't afraid to talk about the things that, that I was going through. As a matter of fact, how unfortunate that once I left the, uh, the Adventist church and went into the gay culture, it was one Friday night I was sitting at a bar and there was a gentleman beside me with his drink. And then another gentleman orders his drink. And after he receives his drink, he says to the bartender, he says, hey, happy Sabbath. And I looked at him, and then the guy beside me, he said, oh yeah, happy Sabbath. And of course, I chimed in too, and the four of us, even the bartender included, started to talk about how we had left the Adventist church. Either we were forced out, or we left on our own, or we basically felt like there was no other option. How sad to think that the only place that I was accepted to share a Sabbath blessing was in a gay bar. And I think that you understand my predicament. I remember going to the gay pride parades and I would see the Christians that would have their signs saying, God hates fags and thank God for AIDS. That didn't bring me back into the church. Instead, what it did is it made me ashamed that I'd ever called myself a Christian before. And so now it was pushing me even further into this new identity that loved me, but their love wasn't the same. It wasn't an accepting love. It was a judgmental love. It basically created this judgment that if I didn't measure up, if I wasn't good looking, if I wasn't wealthy, if I didn't drive the right car or have the right friends, I really didn't make it. But my sexual addiction was what was driving me because that little bit of dopamine release was far better than the avoidance and the, and the rejection that I was experiencing from the church. However, in Matthew 18:20 it says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. And I wasn't praying to God because I wanted nothing to do with the God that I thought wanted nothing to do with me because the only thing I heard in church was that people like me were going to burn in a hotter hell than everybody else. So why would I want to do that? But because my three sisters were praying for me, that's why I'm standing in front of you today. I praise God for them. I was acting out sexually with as many as three men in a day. Men that sometimes I knew that they were uh, openly infected with HIV and yet it wasn't enough to stop my addictive drive. And I believe that through their prayers that God's protective hand has guided me even to today. What's the situation in the church? So you can imagine at 40 years old, stepping into church culture, that was really difficult for somebody like me. And I don't think that it was right, but I was baptized with a boyfriend and a sexual addiction, and I don't advise that any pastor would do such a thing. But God in his word says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And God was taking me on a journey that I didn't understand because I thought I was born this way. I didn't want to change. I wanted to keep my boyfriend, my rich boyfriend. And yet God was slowly introducing himself to me in a different way that was much more intimate than the intimacy I'd received from the 20 years of living in a sexually addicted culture. And as I was walking this out, the church didn't necessarily know how to treat somebody like me, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But in the church culture, I remember I eventually moved to Tennessee where I was a member of a big church, and I went to the pastor and I said, Pastor, I said, I need a men's ministry. And out of a church that had over 700 members, they said, well, we don't really have one. I guess you could be the, the head of that. And I go, no, no, no. I said, I need that ministry. I need to know what it's like to interact with men on a non-sexual basis. And he said, well, pitch your idea to the board. And so I did that night. 20 members, 20 plus members on the board, pastor, head elder were there. And, and I made this I, pitch that we could you know, have a men's ministry weekend on Father's Day weekend. We had a speaker that could come. We could go out to the campgrounds and we could have a meaningful weekend talking about men's issues. And one of the elders that was sitting on the board, he had one of the books that I had suggested from the speaker and he put it down on the table and he looked me in the eye and he pointed at me and he said, I don't wanna be running around in the woods like a bunch of gay men pastor didn't say a word, the head elder said nothing, and this was the best that my church could give me. And so I was used to that kind of rejection. I got in my car, and I was driving home, and I said to God, I hate your church, and I hate your people. And the Lord said to me, so why do you go? And I said, well, I go because you said that's where I go to worship you. This is where the truth is. And he said, continue to do that. And he said, and learn the process of forgiveness because they're my people too. And I'd like to say that I had a different experience, but I sat in the third row on the left in front of the organ for three more years, learning the process of forgiveness. But eventually I had some friends and I was doing Bible studies with them and they liked the little black church in our community. And I remember I was praying to God and I said, Lord, do I take them to the little church and then go back to mine? And he said, no, it took you a while. He said, but go ahead and go with them. 
I went to the head elder and I asked him, I said, hey, do you have any room for somebody that has come from homosexuality and sexual addiction? And he said, sure, have a seat with all the other sinners and can you preach every now and then because we don't have a regular preacher. <laughs> wow, that was kind of novel for me. And I'd been helping out this guy that had one leg. He was a drug addict and a drug dealer and he didn't have running water in his home. So occasionally I'd give him a ride to the store and, and we called him One-Legged Willie. So One-Legged Willie, I'd take him to my house, I'd cut his hair, I'd give him a hot meal and we'd talk about Jesus. So he agreed to come to church and so I bought him a suit and a shoe and I took him to church. And wouldn't you know it, that happened to be Communion Sabbath. So I washed his foot and I realized that he was a visitor there and so I didn't expect him to reciprocate. But one of the brothers came up to me and he said, Mike, let me serve you. And I said, it's okay, I'm with Willie. And he said, no, I insist, let me serve you. And as I sat down and this brother wasn't afraid to touch my feet, he wasn't afraid that he would get something on him and the Holy Spirit was moving in his heart and said, touch that brother and let him know what he means to you. And the only thing that he said to me, he says, Mike, I love your enthusiasm for Jesus. What a difference you've made in our church. And as he wasn't afraid to touch my feet or kneel in front of me, and as he started to pray over me, the Holy Spirit moved in that room. And there were only three other men in that room, but they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, get up and touch him. And those three men came over to me and they just put their hand gently on my shoulder as my brother prayed for me. And then I finally realized that it wasn't, I wasn't part of the ladies' club anymore, that I was actually being included by the men. I was being loved by the men. And you know what? There's no criteria, there's no protocol in our church for that, but that's the power of what the Holy Spirit can do when we're surrendered to Him. Not only does He address the prejudice, not only does He address our ignorance, not only does He address the history and the memory, but He brings about people that are so committed to Him that they're not carrying out their own will, they're carrying out His will. And as those men touched me, I was physically being touched by the Holy Spirit, and that had a transforming power. And my humble church, with a membership of about 20 people, they continue to heal me to this day. Men's ministry. One of the things that I think that we're really lacking in our church, one of the things that Coming Out Ministries recognizes is that we're not an ex-gay ministry. We, we set out to really provide the resources that we were desperate for when we were struggling with identity and sexuality. But when somebody comes up to us, like President Wilson's wife, and he says, you know what? I understand everything that you're talking about in your film, Journey Interrupted. She said, but I was never gay. And she said, what you're really talking about is victory over sin. And so I started to realize that this has an application much further than just sexuality and identity. And so our brothers, our men are down. The reason why so many of the women are taking leadership in our Sabbath school and our churches is because the men are broken. And yet it's the silent secret, it's the, it's the pandemic that's going on within our church that we never dare talk about. A statistic that you might find interesting, 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say that they view porn at least once per month. The statistic is a stark reminder of the prevalence of porn addiction among Christians, particularly among men. It highlights a need for greater awareness and education about the dangers of porn addiction as well as the need for more resources to help those struggling with it. It also serves as a call to action for Christian leaders to take a more active role in addressing this issue. That's why we have the pastor's conference for these next two days. It's to not only inspire you, but to educate you and to equip you for the world in which we're living today. We have to stop living Seventh-day Adventism 1965. We need to recognize that the world is changing rapidly, and not that we change with it, but that we recognize that we can't just hit the surface anymore. We have to go much deeper so that we really do address the needs of those people that are hurting and suffering within our church. I wanna share with you this video clip about Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was a serial killer, and he said exactly what the issue was that he was struggling with that led him to this vile habit that he had. Um, do we not have the video? No? Okay, that's okay. So this woman was actually doing an interview with Ted Bunny, and Ted Bunny said, he said it was pornography that began this pursuit where he was ending up in necrophilia and multiple murders to these women, to a, a homicidal maniac. And this is the statement that he made the night before he was put to death. He said, if people have access to more pornography, he said, you'll see more people like me. 
Harris Unamanya and Tony Scarpino are two of our associate speakers in Coming Out Ministries. They were never gay, but they understand addiction to pornography. They also understand sexual addiction. They also understand the power of Coming Out Ministries and their ability to relate to their issues as well. They're also holding a workshop that's going to address the issues for men. We also have a young woman who's willing to be vulnerable and brave and to talk about her own sexual brokenness uh, before marriage as well. So we have that available for you as well. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. I never thought that I would actually be able to hold a conference for men. Men are the most intimidating group of people for me after adolescent uh, teenagers and then pastors. You guys are the most intimidating for me, but... The Lord gives me opportunities to have weekend conferences for men to help them to understand the power not only of pornography, but most importantly, the power to be restored by the cross, by what Jesus did on that cross for each one of us. Abortion recovery. I don't even know how far to go on this, but I was talking to um, a nurse that works in women's health nearby one of our greatest universities and academies. And she confided in me that the biggest users of the abortion clinic is the Adventist University and the Academy. And yet nobody talks about this issue. And how sad and how unfortunate that our young girls are covering a sin by committing murder, by committing another sin. And yet where's the support in our conferences? Where's the support in our universities? Why don't we talk about this issue from a redemptive standpoint? Well, Coming Out Ministries has that in mind as well. One of the conferences or the workshops that we're going to be offering is abortion recovery. My friend Patty Jackson shares her journey on how she found reconciliation and peace after experiencing abortion at 16 years old. And I think it's really powerful as some of the women that come up to me, they talk about not only their addictions to pornography, which I find shocking, these beautiful, well-educated girls that are sobbing, saying, I'm not ready to be a wife or a mother as long as I'm struggling with this addiction, but also the girls the young girls that have succumbed to abortion for fear that somebody would uh, understand or find out about their unfortunate pregnancy. Our schools and our universities. Genevieve last night gave a powerful testimony of how she was a a university student and how she was uh, sent to the gay affirming group that was on campus that was developed by a seminary professor. And a seminary professor was the one that was overseeing this group, and you would have to stand up and you'd say, hi, I'm Genevieve, I'm a lesbian. How unfortunate when Coming Out Ministries has been escorted off the campuses of our universities. We've not only been escorted off of our campuses, but we've been shut down. And the statement that was made by the leadership in the university is, we are not on the same page with this ministry. We do not agree with their philosophy. And it's not just one campus. Most of our campuses now have a gay-straight alliance, which is basically a support group for people. And maybe some of them will encourage people to be celibate, but they certainly don't talk about the power of Jesus Christ. My friend Daniel lived uh, in Tennessee, and he was going to our university there. He was also living in student housing with his boyfriend, his lover. I've known Daniel since he was 15 years old. I could see that he was struggling with some issues. Uh, He basically wanted nothing to do with our ministry. But he called me just a year ago, and he asked me on the phone, he said, do you believe that Jesus can speak to somebody while they're living in a gay relationship? And I said, absolutely. And as we talked, I met him for that weekend. He'd been living on his own. He broke up with his boyfriend through his own personal conviction as the Lord was leading him. But he was asked to be the president of the local straight gay alliance or gay straight al- gay straight alliance on his university campus, and yet still the Holy Spirit was able to find him, not only to bring him out of that relationship, but then on that restoration process, he spoke for us at GYC last year, and he met a girl, and now they're in a courtship, and they are also going to talk about what it's like to date somebody that has come from the gay culture. Not only that, but we're also going to interview their parents because, you know what, parents suffer with a deeper guilt and shame than I think that even an LGBT person may suffer with. Where's the support for them? I had the opportunity to ask some parents. I've asked individuals. They said, what type of help did you receive from the church? And unfortunately, they sat back and they gave me a very concerned look or confused look. And they said, absolutely nothing. Their shame and their guilt was so great that they were afraid to share it with their church for fear that they would be judged, that they would be censored, that they would be used. 
And so many individuals, unfortunately, find no help from our church today. And again, that's why I believe it's so necessary to have a pastor's conference because we want to offer compassion. We want to offer community. We want to offer them a place where you can come and we understand what you're going through because we've had that experience and we've been there. Tony and Judy Davis came all the way from London, England to make sure that you understand the process of what a parent goes through and how they bleed spiritually when a child is far from home. And the beautiful part is, is they have a very redemptive part of their story as well that you don't want to miss. Say the nice thing, not the right thing. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 1, and I'm not a theologian, remember I'm a hairdresser, so you have to make it kind of simple for me. But it says, In that day seven women will take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, but let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. I see the application in the Christian churches. This is, there's a movement also coming in our denomination that's basically representing, I think, this group of people. Remember, a woman represents a church and they want to take hold of one man. They want him to be the groom. Who's the groom in the Christian church? Jesus Christ. So they want to take the name of Christian, these seven churches, but they say, listen, we have a couple of criteria. We're going to eat our own bread and we're going to wear our own clothing. So hang on a second. In the Bible, right? Bread represents the word of God. They're going to change the word of God to suit themselves. But then the garment also represents this wedding garment, right? The robe of righteousness that Jesus wants to give each one of us. But these seven churches say, no, 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 thanks. We'll take your name, but you can keep your word. You can keep your truth. And you know that whole thing, that righteousness that Jesus did, everything that Jesus did on the cross? No, thank you. Is that lost or saved, brothers and sisters? 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, in the context, verses 1 to 4, it talks about living at the end of time and the difficulty that we're going to have in relationships. And it says that there's a group of people that have a form of godliness. They're all about the love, all about the love of Jesus, but they've left out the power. They deny the power. They say, keep your robe of righteousness. Keep your word. And we're told from those people, stay away. And yet those are the people that are infiltrating our universities and our schools. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I was actually talking with a brother who was coming out of a gay relationship after he'd been married for 30 years to his wife. He had a secret lover on the side. We were studying this, and I have this great concordance um, on one of my Bible apps where I can just touch the word and I get the value of it. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And so out of curiosity, I thought to myself, what does salvation mean in the concordance? And I touched that button, and what I found was salvation means to rescue. To re I need rescue. Don't we need rescue, brothers and sisters? And so that's not hate. That is the, the ultimate form of love, is that Jesus died on that cross, shed his blood, rose on the third day, satisfied everything from the law perfectly in those 33 years so that I could be rescued. When you refuse the wedding garment, when you change the word of God to suit yourself and your feelings, you have refused the rescue, and everything that Jesus did on the cross was for nothing. So the pro-gay movement in our denomination basically makes what Jesus did on the cross impotent. Inconsistency in the seminary, union, division levels, wherever we've gone around the world, we've been rejected. I've had union presidents escort us away. I've had uh, uh, conferences that basically said, we don't need your ministry here, and they refused to allow us to speak in their churches, so we rented a Catholic high school so that we could have our meetings there. Is that interesting? We have pastors that identify as bisexual and they're still allowed to stay in their jobs until the general conference steps in. I want to be real with you and trust me, I don't hate my denomination, I love it because that's why we do what we've done. That's why we've endured the rejection. That's why we've endured the hardships and the judgments of, of the, the conservative movement that thinks that we're affirming gays and then also the liberal ones that think that we, we're cruel and that we cause people to kill themselves. <clears throat> Gays can't change, and God hates them. That was a message that I heard when I was a young person. 
And now the movement is gays still can't change, but now God loves them. What's interesting to me, make up your mind, because we have these really conservative people that think that homosexuality is, is the worst sin above all else, and that God not only hates them, but that they're going to burn in a hotter hell than everybody else. But now the movement that's coming in is that, no, no, gays still can't change, and God loves them because they cannot change. And if you tell the gay person that they can't change, that that's hate speech. What's interesting to me, because the one thing that they have in common, God hates them over here, but God loves them over here, but none of them can change. Did anybody bother to read verse 11 in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians? Because it says, such were some of you, but you've been washed, and you've been sanctified, you've been justified by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So let me break this down for you, because when you make a group of people exclusive, you cut them off from the transforming power of God. Verse 11 is what Jesus does for a sinner. And verses 9 and 10 talks about all the abominations that won't be in heaven and gossipers are listed just along with the homosexual offender. Remember, God does not have a problem with a person that has confusion about their gender. God doesn't have a problem with somebody that has attraction to the same sex. His problem is those that act on it because he wants to restore us. And when you act on it, you pull yourself further away from the identity that God gave us in Psalms 139. So we don't want to make anybody exclusive. Whether you hate them, whether God hates them or loves them, the answer is in verse 11, because of the power of what Jesus does. He transforms us. It's his power of what he did on the cross that makes a difference. We cannot make any group of people exclusive anymore. Equipping the home and the church and the school. I was in um, Tennessee, where I live. I was at the Walmart getting new tires, and I thought to myself, what does the Bible Belt say about identity? And I found this book, and it says, what is God like? And everything looked normal. The kids looked normal. The parents looked normal. They talked about God is like a mother. God is like a father. The children are normal with, you know, normal colored hair, normal color eyes, no earrings, no piercings or anything, until I turned to the page of what God is like. And God is represented here as non-binary people with nose rings and purple hair and green hair and dancing effeminately on this ribbon of color. And any child that would look at that, especially me, when I was six years old, if I would have seen this book, I would want them to be my God too. Not only that, but there's a book called My Princess Boy. This is being targeted to our preschoolers and it, the father loves his son. And he tells him how pretty he looks in his dress and the father takes him by the hand and tells him to twirl. These are the books that our preschoolers are being given. Jacob's new dress. There he, Jacob is standing on the landing of his home and he's in a dress and it says there are lots of different ways to be a boy. All of this is being targeted to our preschoolers. Paul Washer says, your children will go to public school and they will be trained for somewhere around 15,000 hours in ungodly secular thought and then they'll go to Sabbath school and they'll color a picture of Noah's Ark and you think that that's going to stand against the lies that they're being told? Brothers and sisters, wake up. It's not 1965 anymore. We have to provide education for our children. We have to protect their innocence, but we also need to equip them so that when they're confronted with counterfeit identities and sexualities, that they at least have a foundation. We don't have to be ashamed of what God has put in our world today. California passes a bill punishing parents who don't affirm their child's chosen gender identity. How can we protect our children and guard their innocence and at the same time educate them about the foundation of God's identity and sexuality? Well, you know what? I was asked to speak at an academy that had a K through 12th grade. And I thought to myself, what am I going to speak to the kindergartners through sixth graders? And the things that I share with the teenagers, I certainly can't share with these young kids. And yet the Lord inspired me to come up with a program called In His Image. It's a five-day program that we do at, at grade school levels for preschoolers to sixth grade. It's a powerful opportunity to affirm their identity and sexuality without introducing them to LGBT issues. We start off with girls and boys are what we are, Genesis 1:27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. How many kinds did God make? Two. We keep it really simple. Boys and girls already understand this. It takes a PhD to mess it up. And so as we go through this, I tell the boys, I go, if you're a boy, stand up. And the boys, they stand up. And I go, if your girl stand up and the boys drop and the girls stand up. And it's a very simple exercise to remind kids that God only made two kinds. We talk about how the family was instituted in the Garden of Eden. And God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and to have children. How beautiful, because the image of God was placed in every boy to be a father. And the image of God was placed in every girl to be a mother. Wow, how wonderful. Because when a father looks into his baby's face and says, wow, she's got my eyes. And when a father looks into his baby's face and says, wow, she's got my chin, 
God has given us the express honor and privilege to know what it's like to be a life giver too. But we know that the enemy wants to be God. And you can imagine how jealous he is that God has given this special gift of creation to man and not to angels. We know that the devil came to steal, kill, and to destroy. And nothing destroys, kills, or destroys the precious image of God that is placed in every man and woman than sexual sin. It's not limited to the LGBT issue. It's also inclusive of pornography, masturbation, premarital sex, abortion. Even divorce destroys the very image of God that was placed in one man and one woman in a committed relationship. I tell the kids that we have a fingerprint, makes us unique. And you know what? Everyone's got a different fingerprint. Can I change my fingerprint, folks? I can. I cut my finger when I was six years old and I have a huge scar across my fingerprint and I realized that I can change my fingerprint. But did you know you have a fingerprint on the inside? And that fingerprint is our DNA. And there are only two kinds of DNA, male and female. If I have a sex change, I may look female on the outside and you can bury me and then in about 400 years you're going to dig up my bones and my DNA will still tell that I'm a male. It's fixed, it's unchangeable, and there's only two kinds, male and female. So I use this illustration of my dog. That's my dog, Bo, on the left. And so, you know, being a hairdresser, uh, I like to give my dog a costume, and so one summer I shaved him to look like a lion. The highest compliment is somebody in East Tennessee actually reported that they saw a lion in East Tennessee. <laughs> but did it change who he was? And the children say no. Does he look like a lion? And the children, they're like, yes, he looks like a lion. I go, but is he? And they go, no, he's just a dog. And so we talk about costumes can really change the way we look. We go through the Bible examples of people that wore costumes. Everything from Satan wearing the costume of a snake to, of course, Leah and Jacob disguising themselves. The kids come up with all of these stories and we talk about the fact that how we appear makes a difference. Then we go to Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, and it says that, that God wants boys to dress like boys and girls to dress like girls. Why? I ask the kids and they go, because it's confusing. Even children understand these, these elementary lessons, and we still haven't said anything about identity or sexuality to the children. We talk about God's rainbow. We talk about God's rainbow, and what's really amazing is that the Bible tells us what all of these beautiful colors mean. So instead of worrying about what the rainbows are that other groups of people are talking about, we study God's rainbow, and we study the seven colors, the seven colors of God's rainbow. And you know, just a couple years ago, I didn't even know that God's rainbow had seven colors. I actually had to look on the internet to make sure. And so did you know that the three primary colors that make up all the colors in the universe are actually red, blue, and yellow? Did you know that the Bible talks about those as the, as the Godhead? The red represents the blood of Jesus. Yellow represents the wings of the dove of yellow gold. Blue represents the law, which is the throne of God. It's our liberty. It's our freedom. And out of those three colors, we make up all the colors of the rainbow. The secondary level of colors are the green, the orange, and the purple. But did you know that there's one color that is not celebrated in this world that is in God's rainbow? And as I was looking this up, I was looking up in the, in the Bible and I said, indigo, indigo's got to be in the Bible. You know, God didn't just randomly throw that in to make it seven. And I said, Lord, what does that mean? And I didn't find the word indigo. And then I looked in spirit of prophecy because I'm an Adventist. And I said, what does the spirit of prophecy say about indigo? Nothing. And so I prayed at night and I said, Lord, it must mean something. You're going to have to help me. And so I woke up one morning and the Lord spoke to me and he said, Mike, if indigo is in the Bible, is there anywhere in the Bible where blue and purple that make indigo, is there anywhere in the Bible that it's represented? And I thought to myself, the sanctuary. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We have the sanctuary message. It's the sanctuary that represents the indigo color because that's where Jesus is right now interceding on my behalf so that I can not only be justified but also sanctified in the process. Indigo is now my favorite color because I realize that it completes the rainbow that is not being celebrated in the world because remember, they're going to eat their own bread and they're going to wear their own apparel. They have refused the indigo color. They have refused everything that Jesus is doing in the sanctuary on my behalf to make me fit to be in the presence of God. Do you start to see the problem that we have? And so we do these examples. I mix the colors in front of the kids. We've had a lot of fun, right, Harrison, when all the bottles got mixed up? That was crazy. We have a, a coloring thing for the kids to color in the colors as they explore it. Look at the happy little faces in their Sabbath school class. And then we use that as a children's story to educate the parents on what the rainbow means. We don't have to be afraid of the rainbow anymore, brothers and sisters. Identity and sexuality. 
A father came up to me, and he wants to know why his daughter is cutting off her hair and hanging a gay pride flag, flag in her bedroom. And, I, and he said, you know, she comes and she does a family worship and she sings a song. And then I asked her, I said, does your daughter have unlimited access to the internet? And he said, well, of course. You know, my 14-year-old daughter, I respect the fact that she has the intelligence to know what to, what to you know, look at. I said, really, there are 50-year-old men that don't even have the power to control what they look at on the internet. Giving our children unlimited access to the internet is like giving a razor blade to a baby. The media, they are teaching our children how to blur the gender lines. We have to have something stronger. We have to make sure that we're addressing this in a way that doesn't condemn people, but rather elevates them to understand the identity that God wants for each one of us to have. We have actresses that are having sex changes, and some of them are quite convincing. And this is what the world is promoting, even to the point where we now have exponential uh, spikes in these statistics about girls that are struggling with gender identity. The green spike right there that you see started in 2014, and the huge spike that you see going straight up started in 2020. And it's mostly teenage girls that are struggling with gender dysphoria. The yellow line is for males. I want to share with you part of the redemptive part. I think I'm going to make it, Pastor. So I want to share with you the redemptive part. We cannot deny the power of Jesus Christ. Ah, unfortunately, it's all up there. Um, the image that you see on the left, I'm sorry, on the far right, that is a girl named Ray. She went by the name of Ray. She wanted nothing to do with femininity because she was molested by boys and girls on the school playground. She was raised in a drug-addicted home. Her parents didn't care if she wore Spider-Man or Superman underwear. And so this little girl grew up. By the time she was 16 years old, she was calling herself Ray. And if you called her Marissa, she'd ball up her fist and threaten to punch you in the face. She decided that she wanted a sex change. And so she went to Seattle, Washington, where she got a counselor and a therapist. And she could take the hormones, but she would have to live as a man for two and a half years before she could have the surgery. While she was in the process of having this, uh, the therapies to change her sex, you'd think she'd be on easy street. You'd think everything would be okay. But she started to struggle with this deep, dark depression. And this depression was so deep that she called the only friend that she thought would be there for her, which was a Christian that lived in Denver. And her friend said, come to me. And she said, you know what? I don't have any money. So her friend paid for her to come. And instead of saying three days, she ended up saying three months. And during that time, her friend loved her, prayed for her, she didn't judge her. If you want me to call you Ray, I'll call you Ray. If you want me to call you Marissa, I'll call you whatever you want. I just want you to live. And during that time, as she helped her to bathe and helped her to eat and helped her to take walks, not only was she praying for her, but she was reading to her. And as Ray found Psalms 139, for first time ever in her life, she looked up and she said, God, how do you see me? And the next image that she got was of a woman in a long dress with long hair, just praising God. And she immediately dismissed that and said, that's not me. But what she did do is she continued to read the word of God. And as she found Psalms 139, it started to make a difference in her life. She, talked, she read the words that, that God is in search of us and he'll go up higher down low, darkness or light. It's all the same to him. And that it was God that's pursuing us. It is God that has loved us. It is God that knit us, our delicate inward parts together in our mother's womb. All of our members are recorded in God's book. It wasn't happenstance. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a joke. God knew exactly who I was to be even before the earth was formed. And as she started to realize that, she started to replace some of the articles of clothing. She started to allow her hair to grow. And this is who Marissa lives as, as a center picture. And that's a powerful statement about the power of God to transform lives. We cannot make any group of people exclusive from the rights of what Jesus did on the cross. Because if we do... Instead, we're not giving them anything different than what the world is giving them. Behavior modification is good if you want to lose weight or if you want to stop smoking, but that's not what we're about. We're not about behavior modification. We're about a divine transformation. Do you believe that the power of Jesus Christ can still restore people? Because that's a message that people need to get, and that's what we want to provide in the next two days that you're here. Reaching out from beyond the church, the Freedom March. The Freedom March in 2019 was held in Orlando, Florida, just a few miles away from the Pulse shooting, which killed 49 individuals. Two individuals that survived that shooting were actually there at the Freedom March. 
Coming Out Ministries was participating in this march as well with multiple denominations. We gave out 150 copies of our movie, Journey Interrupted. We gave out t-shirts. We had incredible dialogues with people. What was so amazing is that I was there with Catholics and Baptists and Lutherans and Evangelicals and all kinds of denominations. And what was so amazing is that we were completely on the same page. We were completely unified by the Word of God. And I can't even get that in my own church. What was so powerful is that there is a movement, and I got a taste of what I think is the latter rain, where God is bringing us together. There are people that are walking away from these identities that are being shoved down their throats. Miracles that are happening inside the church that I've experienced. In Pasadena, well, Wayne begged me to come. Remember, I didn't want to come. I said, you deal with it. It was open to the community. They were already protesting. The, the pro-gay movement within our denomination that is not acknowledged by the denomination, however, it has a lot of um, power. And so they influenced the LGBT community of Pasadena, and they said, you need to shut this down. You need to protest it. You need to do whatever you can to shut this down. And the pastor was so humble, you wouldn't know if he was a pastor or the janitor. And he was so humble, and the conference president called him. He goes, shut it down. We can't have this. We can't have this kind of attention. Wayne and I were interviewed by a local television station that night. The next day, as we showed up, sure enough, there were the protesters with their signs, honk if you love. And every time they honked, it was a reminder to us that there was a group of people that felt marginalized and, and distant outside. But you know what? We went out anyway. We met them. Wayne and I talked about that if we were ever protested, we would give them water. If it was raining, we would give them rainbow umbrellas, Right? And so this church, they bumped it up exponentially. These little old ladies, these little old Filipino ladies in their Sabbath best went out to the protesters and they said, listen, honey, we got hot chocolate and cookies for you. And if you get tired, you can come inside and have a seat. Use our facilities. And the pastor went out and he introduced himself. The head elder went out and posed with pictures with some of the different protesters who were there. At lunchtime, the pastor went out and he said to the protesters, he said, we've made you lunch today, haystacks. And he said, and we want you to come inside. And one of the protesters was holding his flag, and he says, I can't. My job is to hold this flag. And the pastor said, I'll tell you what. I'll hold the flag while you come inside and eat. And there's a picture of the pastor holding that flag while their brother came in and ate his meal. Somebody left a comment card and said, thank you for being polite to us. I'm almost ashamed to think that somebody should have to submit that to a church, to an Adventist church. Shouldn't that be our norm? Shouldn't that be the expectation? A personal story is that when I came into the church, I was a mess, still struggling sexually. I met a couple of other men that were also coming out of their gay lives. We weren't sure what we were going to do. We had one foot in, one foot out, but we became a support group for each other. We weren't acting out with each other, but we were going to different churches trying to find, does God really have the answer for people like us? My friend Ruben on the bottom of this pyramid, he was a skinny Puerto Rican guy. My friend Wayne on the other side of me was this big muscle-bound black man, and the three of us were like the three stooges. We would go to different churches, and I'm sure people would say, oh, they're back. So Ruben was invited by this Colombian immigrant family to come and do Bible studies. And they had a young daughter named Michelle, who's up there about 10 years old. And you know what? My friend Ruben called me one night, and he said, Mike, there's this Bible study on Sunday night. You should come. And I go, eh. You know, I was in church all day Sabbath. I don't need that. And he said, well, they feed us. And I said, okay, I'm in. <laughs> Power of food, folks. And every Sunday night, there I was with my friends, three homosexuals in their living room, studying the word of God every Sunday with their 10-year-old daughter. I don't know how they missed it, but one night, Gladys said to her husband, do you think they're gay? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. How would I know? And she said, should we be concerned about our daughter? And he said, the same blood that was shed for us was shed for them. And Gladys said, I'm so glad you said that because I've really learned to love them. And you know what? That began a friendship. Not only a friendship, we had nothing in common. I'm this hotshot hairdresser that's doing television people's hair. I drove a convertible Mercedes. I had a condo on a lake. I had a house with a pool. I gave them nothing, but they gave me everything. And they lived in this humble, tiny apartment. And you know what? That had a powerful influence on me. And when I moved to Tennessee, they moved with me. They lived with me until they found their house. I sold my house four years ago. I've been on the road for Jesus ever since, and they've designated a room in their house for me whenever I'm in town. That's the relationship that I believe that God wants to form in our churches. That young girl grew up. We have a close relationship, and when this young man wanted to marry her, she said, if you want permission to marry me, you have to ask my father and my Carducci. 
They have two beautiful children. They call me uncle. As a matter of fact, my friend Michelle, being a Hispanic uh, person, it's real important to know where your older people are going to go. And she asked me one day, she goes, you know, what are you going to do when you get old? And I said, I'm already old. And she said, no, really, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'll go to a nursing home, whatever. You know, the Lord's got a plan. And she says, I don't want you to go to a nursing home. And I go, I'm okay. Really, I'm okay. And she said, I'll take care of you. Can you imagine that? The power of what God is creating relationships in the church. The, these people, they're no blood relationship to me. We socially have nothing in common. And yet, through the love of Jesus Christ, I now know that somebody's going to take care of me when I get old. For over 12 years, we've been providing prayer, support, and community for individuals and families. It's not enough to tell the truth. We also have to put that truth into action. Not only do we provide prayer lines, we also provide conferences for the last three years to help people, individuals, families, parents, to find community where they can come together. Hasn't it helped, Jerry? Daisy? We have an international prayer line. People from Europe, South Africa, Australia, they come together and we talk about the issues that we're struggling with. And we also provide that for parents on Mondays and Thursdays and Fridays as well. So I hope that you'll be blessed by what you're about to hear. I hope that you'll be equipped when you leave to know that the power of Jesus Christ is still alive, but the compassion and love we are required to give to make sure that people have access to what Jesus did on the cross. Thank you.